In this module, we're going to have a look at dealing with a suspected neck and or spinal injury. Now, this may be following from a road traffic collision, maybe somebody's fallen down the stairs, come off of a bike, taken an awkward trip or a fall, or there may be some environmental clues, perhaps the way the person is actually laying, other people may be able to tell me what has happened, there could be wet floor signs, forklift, step ladder, it may be quite obvious to tell. The first thing to consider that if my casualty is crying out in pain or they look like they're in a bad way or they're able to tell me what hurts, where it hurts, maybe even what happened, then strangely, this is a good thing because it means that they are conscious and they are breathing. What I'm gonna to need to do is try to just keep them as calm as possible, keep them as still as possible, try to make the space and the area as clear as possible and offer reassurance until medical assistance has arrived. What I'm obviously concerned about is my casualty who appears to be unresponsive. Again, this could be following any number of incidents. What I wanna be very careful about is my approach to the casualty. If I think I may be dealing with a neck or a spinal injury for obvious reasons, I want to try to limit the movement as much as possible. So upon my initial approach to the casualty, I'm gonna to try to approach from the head end rather than either side, just in case they inadvertently move their head. I wanna to try to avoid asking any leading questions. For example, can you hear me? Something that may invoke a yes or a no answer. Because if they can hear me, instinctively, again, they're quite liable to move their head, therefore their neck. What I want to do, and there's no script for this, but a suggestion would be to place a hand very gently out in front of you, slowly and delicately approach the casualty from the head end with verbal instructions such as, I'm here to help you, open your eyes if you can and just focus on my hand. Try to keep nice and still, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm then going to kneel at the head and I'm gonna very gently with my hands just support either side. What I want to be very careful of is actually covering the ears over because that can cause a little bit of a balance shift even in a subconscious state. I want to try to keep the ear holes as free as I can. Now, in all honesty, there's only one ideal outcome here and that is from this position, I'm able to assess that my casualty is breathing normally. If they are, I want to keep my hands in that position of support whilst I await further medical assistance. Either 999 speaker or ideally, so I don't move, I'm gonna get the attention of a bystander to call the emergency services. From this position, if I'm not able to ascertain that my casualty is breathing okay, I'm still going to need to gently rotate the head back with the intention of giving them an airway, lifting the tongue off of the back of the throat. Once again, I'm going to look, listen and feel as best I can for breathing for 10 seconds. Again, if after opening the airway, the breathing appears to be okay, that's fantastic. I'm going to maintain this position whilst I await emergency assistance, making sure the operator is aware that I have performed a chin lift to give them an airway. Unfortunately, if the breathing still does not appear normal to me after this, I've only got one possibility and that is to commence CPR. My casualty has fallen into the category of not responding and not breathing properly. I could of course cause physical damage by giving chest compressions, particularly if there's an existing neck and or spinal injury. All I'm able to levy this against is the fact that if I don't do CPR, there is a good chance that this tragedy could unfold into a fatality. And very sadly, that's the lesser of two evils. So I'm going to continue my CPR at a rate of 30 compressions to two breaths, 30 to two, until the emergency services arrive. And again, if I can source a defibrillator, that's fantastic. Taking a small step back, when I go to my initial check on my casualty, if I am satisfied with their breathing, I still want to, at the earliest available opportunity, roll them onto their side. This is purely because if, while they're on their back, they start to gag, they look like they're about to vomit, I'm gonna to have to very quickly get them off of their back anyway to keep that airway protected. So it makes sense to get the casualty onto their side anyway, 
as soon as possible. To do this, I'm going to try to require the assistance of another one, two, or even three first aiders. Now, whoever is in charge of the head tells everybody else what they need to do. We're going to very, very gently bring the casualties legs together and I'm going to have a first aider knelt at the casualties shoulders, if available, one at the casualties hips and one at the casualties legs. On the command of the first aider at the head, everybody's going to very gently reach across and rest their hands on the opposite part of the body as to where they are. And on an agreeable command, usually on three, all of the first aiders very gently rotate the casualty and roll them over towards them. The role of the first aider on the head as they come over is to offer support, come up onto your elbows and try to make sure that the neck and spine stay in a straighter line as possible. Whilst they're on their side, we can of course swap out the first aider at the end of the head. You can get other people to put their hands under yours to help take some of the weight. Or we can of course utilise cushions, blankets, jackets, etc. The aim is simply to try to keep them in a straight line until the emergency services arrive and they can take over. The very last thing, folks, with respect to neck or spinal injuries, if we suspect that we're dealing with somebody who's been involved in a road traffic collision or they come off a bike, in terms of crash helmets, we do not remove crash helmets. Depending on the extent of the injury, it may be the helmet that's physically keeping the head together. We could cause significant injury trying to remove a crash helmet. Leave this to the fire service slash emergency services. We are able to go as far, if we can locate it, as undoing and unfastening the chin strap. This will take some pressure off of the airway and may be enough to just slightly increase the ability for the casualty to breathe. 